So hi, everyone. Welcome to the special session for course base and professional masters. Uh, I'm Natasha Lowe, the Administrative Coordinator for Life Science Education at Graduate and Life Science Education. I'm going to bring up our bring up our first speaker. Uh, her name is Rachel Zula. She's uh, from Graduate and Life Sciences Education, and she's going to give a brief overview of our programs. If uh, Rachel Zula, you can uh, share your screen. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Zula. Thank you very much for coming today. I'm just gonna share my screen, so just give me one second. I hope everyone's doing well today. Uh, in Toronto, if you're in Toronto, we have been blessed with a beautiful day outside. So I encourage everyone to go outside. I'm sure all of us are experiencing some form of cabin fever at this point. Um, so I really encourage you all to go outside and take a walk and enjoy this beautiful, beautiful sunny day. Uh, I just came back from about an hour walk today, so I'm kind of all pepped and ready to go. Um, so my name again is Rachel Zula. I'm the Graduate Affairs Officer for the Graduate in Life Sciences Education Office here in the Temberty Faculty of Medicine. Uh, many of you are probably uh, are here at the University of Toronto, um, so you're familiar uh, with how this university works, but I'm going to just go over a couple of things. Um, so that in the event that you're not familiar with or some of our visitors who are from outside of the University of Toronto, they sort of get to know who we are. There we go. So the University of Toronto definitely prides itself in, you know, being one of the best in uh, the country, if not the world. So as you can see, we've listed a whole bunch of uh, the rankings and, you know, consistently the University of Toronto ranks number one um, across all of these different types of rankings from Times Higher Education to the US News and World Report. Generally speaking on an international platform. So across all these, you know, 300 or so different universities around the world, if not more, uh, we are talking about, we roughly rank, I'd say about top 25 in the world, which is a very, you know, something that we should be very proud in. A lot of that is because we have so many experts in certain fields. And one of the fields that we have experts in primarily are in uh, life sciences or uh, life and biological sciences. So you'll see again, in Canada, we're ranked number one in life and biological sciences. Um, the US News and World Report in 2020 also ranked us number one. Um, number four, uh, internationally in terms of clinical medicine, biochemistry, molecular biology and genetics, um, and pharmacology and toxicology. In terms of other impacts that the University of Toronto has, it contributes about 15, just over $15 billion to the Canadian economy every year, which is quite significant. Uh, the faculty of medicine, the Temerty Faculty of Medicine accounts for about 25% of the total biomedical and life care, healthcare uh, research revenue. So the national average is about 14%. So uh, we do very well in that field. But I think what we're the most proud of is uh, that we rank the sixth in the world in terms of publication and citations in the top 50 highest impact journals in medicine uh, and other related fields. So you're definitely going to be working at some point with experts uh, in, in, a, in these fields. And I think that's what's most exciting. In terms of uh, our alumni, the majority are from Canada and the States, but we also have people who have graduated uh, who are from the United Kingdom, China, Australia, India, Singapore, South Korea. So inevitably you're gonna meet a bunch of people who are from different countries, which I think only adds to the wealth of uh, the experience that you have here as a student. In terms of the Temerty Faculty of Medicine, so just to give everybody a bit of background in how graduate education works, graduate education falls under the School of Graduate Studies and they sort of oversee all the graduate programs um, across the university. Uh, because it's such a big job, they actually um, designate 
there's faculties obviously, and within each faculty, they have sort of an office that oversees um, the graduate education there. So in the Tamarty Faculty of Medicine, there are about 13 graduate departments, and that's what falls under our portfolio. Uh, as of winter 2021, we had about 2,800 uh, graduate students, which I think uh, were just behind uh, Faculty of Arts and Science and, and maybe uh, the Ontario Institute for Studies. So we're fairly a big faculty, which most people don't realize. So this is a very, very... <laughs> It's a bit busy, but it basically tells you all the programs that we have in the Faculty of Medicine. Um, and the ones that I've circled, those are the ones that are going to be presented today. So I'd like to also take this opportunity to thank all the guest speakers for taking their time out, especially during a beautiful day like this, uh, to come and present their program so that you as students know, um, you know what we have available and something that might interest you uh, for your careers. I know I talked a lot about the research that the University of Toronto does, um, and we're very proud of that. But the other thing we're also proud of is that we really want to make sure that students have a great experience here at the University of Toronto. And so there is a national survey that goes out every six years. I, unfortunately, I don't have the data for 2020 yet. Um, next year I will. But the last time it was uh, given out was uh, spring 2016. And just a couple of highlights about 90, and this includes uh, research students as well as professional students. About 90% of students rated their relationship with their faculty as between good to excellent. 90% were overall were satisfied with the quality of teaching. And 92% were satisfied uh, with their academic experience in their program. So that's a really, that's something that we should be very proud of as well. This sort of gives you a map, it might be a little bit hard to read, but we are a very huge um, faculty in medicine in the sense that we have about nine fully affiliated. And if we add the, um, the partially affiliated hospitals and research institutes, uh, that grows to maybe 11. And so we're very in interconnected with all the hospitals here. Uh, we call it University Row. Uh, because the major hospitals in Toronto, if not the province, if not the country, are all located on uh, just down the street from the University of Toronto on University Avenue. Um, in terms of tuition, I thought this would be important information to provide you. Um, in 2020, 2021, these were the, um, these were the tuition rates. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to update this for the incidental fees. They probably, I'm not gonna, I can, I can in include that information in an email if there's a follow-up email, um, but that's also easily, can be easily found on uh, student accounts website in the University of Toronto. If you just Google student accounts, University of Toronto and look under School of Graduate Studies, you'll be able to find the same information. And then how to apply, um, you know, explore. And, and see, this is why you're here. This is a great opportunity to do, just get a, get a sense of what each program can offer. And I strongly recommend that you start working on your application early. Um, check with the individuals who you'll meet, and I'm sure you're gonna get their contact information. Um, just check and see if there's anything else that you're missing. Um, maybe there's more than one deadline. I think for course-based and for professional masters, there really is only one deadline, but it's worth checking. Um, if you wanted to apply, uh, the website's right there, apply.sgs.utoronto.ca, and the application fee for each uh, application is $125. So this is just a map of everybody, of like our campus here. So the big star here is us. And then all these stars that you see are all the hospitals and research institutes I don't think it can count, the picture isn't big enough to capture some other ones that are further west, but gives you a sense of how huge uh, basically our campus is. And I think that might be it. I don't know Thank if you take, you're taking any questions, Natasha, but I'm happy to answer any questions that the audience may have. Okay, uh, we'll take questions afterwards. That'd okay. be great. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. So uh, up next is Rory McEwen from School of Graduate Studies, if you can share your screen. 
Hi everyone, my name is Roy McEwen. I work at the School of Graduate Studies and I just switched my camera on for a second so you don't worry that you're being talked at by a giant black capped chickadee. Um, in terms of what I've got to share with you today, um, I'm from the School of Graduate Studies so we deal with all graduate programs at the university. Uh, so I'm doing a very shallow, shallow examination of what is graduate study like and how is it different from undergraduate study. Uh, can everyone hear me properly? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thanks for the confirmation. So a few takeaway points that you really need to know is that graduate studies at U of T are incredibly decentralized. Even within the Temerity Faculty of Medicine, from program to program, programs are structured differently, have different application requirements, have different admission requirements. Um, and so you really are being called upon to do your own research to find out about the programs that you're interested in and what their requirements are. The good news is that virtually any question you could ask us today, the answers are available online. And I strongly encourage you to do your research before contacting any uh, graduate departments for clarification of anything, because if you you know, email the department to ask for something that's readily available on their website, it's not a great first impression and that could be detrimental to your application. The other thing to remember is that everything is going to take longer than you think it will in researching your program, putting together an application and getting that application in. So what's the difference between graduate and undergraduate study? And I'm gonna stereotype hugely, I know that I'm doing it, um, but the standard stereotype of undergrad is students in a lecture hall learning from an expert who is sharing his or her information with those students. In other words, they're receivers or consumers of knowledge rather than creators. The standard format for teaching in graduate study, though, is really the seminar, where different members of the seminar, the students, are taking on a chunk of the teaching load and teaching their peers the material that they've really gone into in depth. So the teacher-student relationship is a bit different. You're very much a junior colleague of, your fac of, of, of the professors rather than just a student. And one way to think about this is the analogy that a, a friend of mine used. Um, doing undergraduate studies a little bit like snorkeling. You stay on the surface, you can explore a few beautiful reefs, but you're staying pretty close to the surface. For a master's program, it really is much more like scuba diving. You've got a tank there, you're going down one reef and you're really learning it in depth. If you go on to do a PhD, and that's not the focus today, um, that's like being in a submarine, you know, setting yourself up down and underwater for a long period of time, really getting in depth. I think for the professional programs, the most important thing, difference that I can emphasize between grad and undergrad is there aren't majors and minors in graduate master's programs. You're doing a subject and becoming really expert in that subject. So deciding whether or not graduate study for you, for you, you need to know about the different options. And today, of course, we're talking about professional master's program. Um, depending on the program, they can take one to three years to complete. I believe in, in the Faculty of Medicine, they're all under two years. Uh, they're usually course-based, and some of them will include an internship or a practicum. Um, and very often, they'll be very specifically geared at a specific career trajectory and I'm gonna leave that to the other speakers to discuss. We're gonna skip over information on research masters and PhD programs. So if you do have questions, I can deal with that in the question and answer section. So how do you find the right program for yourself? Do you go to the School of Graduate Studies website? You're welcome to, we have a comprehensive list of all programs, but that's just it, it's a list. It's not giving you the information about the programs themselves. So if you're finding programs on our site, Always remember that the most important information we provide about any given program is the link back to the program's own website. But you really also want to start shaking your network and talking to people who you know or who you've seen online. You want to find out who's doing the kind of work you want to do and how did they get there. This can often mean cold calling people through LinkedIn or you know, contacting friends of your family or family of friends and finding people who are where you want to be in five to 10 years time and finding out how they got there. Other questions you have to ask include, well, are you gonna be able to fund this? Do you have the resources to, to take this program? And are there any ways to enrich the program through collaborative specialization? We'll talk a little bit more about them at the end. No, I'll talk about them a little bit more right now. Collaborative specializations are not degree programs. They are the best described as certificate programs that you take in addition to 
whatever degree program you're in. Um, and I'll use the example of neuroscience. Uh, when I'm talking with prospective students, they're often very surprised to find out that there is no master's program in neuroscience at the University of Toronto. This is surprising because we have a ton of neuroscientists at the University of Toronto. They're just scattered through different graduate units like the Institute of Medical Science, Department of Psychology, Physiology, and so on and so forth. So collaborative specializations allow students from those different programs to get together in a joint seminar and look at neuroscience from an interdisciplinary perspective. They then take particular electives and they graduate with both a degree and a certificate in neuroscience. In terms of applying to graduate study, what do you need to get in? I color coded this slide. So anything that's in blue is something that the School of Graduate Studies has determined. Anything that's in red is determined by the program looking at your application. So we say that for a master's degree, you need to have an appropriate bachelor's degree or its equivalent with a mid year, sorry, with a mid B average in the final year. Now, those are the minimum requirements university wide. Different programs may have higher requirements. They may need a particular average in your last two years. They may need a particular average in courses related to your discipline, or they might even have a higher minimum average. Do you need a B plus to get in? Do you need an A minus to get in? This is going to vary enormously from program to program. And so you really need to make sure if you're, especially if you're applying to more than one program, that you've got the information you need to apply appropriately to both. Uh, each program may also have additional requirements. Uh, some programs ask that you write the GRE exam, either the general test or the subject test. And it's also important to remember that a lot of the programs that you're looking at today are very competitive. So meeting the minimum requirements will not or will often not be enough to get you into the program. You need other aspects that make you stand out. So you're going to want to really understand the application procedure and give yourself a lot of time to do it. You'll be asked to submit informal transcripts, contact information for referees, usually a personal statement, and then a number of other different requirements. You also want to ask yourself now how you're going to be paying for this. Um, I'm going to encourage representatives from each program to talk a little bit about what funding options are available, but a whole lot of options that would be open in a research-based master's program aren't actually available to students in professional programs. So it's important to remember what funding might be available and what plans you can put in place to make sure that you can afford your education. One thing that a lot of students find themselves doing is taking some time off. They finish their undergrad, they go, they work, pay off some debt, de-stress, save some money and come back. That can be a great idea, but I want to warn you, if you do that, make sure you line up your references before you take time off so that they, you know, can jot some notes down so that when you come back to them, they can actually write you a strong, detailed, personal reference. So some application tips. It's going to take time, not just to pull together the materials that you want, but to draft your statement and really craft something that makes you stand out and shows why you're a good fit for the program. Uh, it's important when you're choosing your referees to choose them wisely. You want them to be able to write a strong reference explaining why you're a good fit for the program. And that usually involves a fair amount of detail. So office hours are a great time to get to know profs in whose class you're doing well, or hey, to get help so you do better in their class. Um, and you want to choose referees to balance out three different things. One is seniority. And that, that's not cynicism. When a real subject expert says, you know what, I've been teaching for 30 years and this student is one of the strongest I've ever taught, that's going to carry more weight than someone very junior saying, yeah, for my first year teaching, this kid seems really impressive. You also want to make sure that you're getting referees who are very familiar with your work. So if you've done a research placement, the supervisor for that could be really good. Uh, if you've been heavily involved or taken more than one class with a particular prof, that's great. Have you been going to office hours and will they actually be able to speak in detail to who you are? And then of course you want to have done well in the class that you, or classes that you took with them. Uh, so give yourself plenty of time. Remember that your referees will also need time because around those application deadlines, they're writing references for so many students. Um, and make sure that you've really done your background research on whatever program you're looking at. Um, that's all I've got for you today because I want to hand over to the experts on the given programs, so I will bow out. Uh, thank you, Rory. Um, if Maeve Doyle Katamaris from Biomedical Communications can share your screen.
Thanks, Natasha. The need for individuals with scientific training and the skills necessary to design accurate and effective science media has never been more apparent than in this time of COVID-19. Hi everyone, I'm Maeve Doyle, the Graduate Program Administrator for the Master of Science in Biomedical Communications, or BMC for short. BMC is a two-year program offered through the Institute of Medical Science in the Temerty Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto and the Department of Biology at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. We're one of only four accredited programs in the world, the only accredited graduate program in Canada, and a two-campus program. Our administrative offices are housed primarily in the state-of-the-art health sciences complex at UTM and we have facilities on the stately St. George campus. Students in our program are engaged in the creation and evaluation of a range of visual tools, including medical illustration, media and user experience design, animation, and virtual simulations. Our students benefit from small class sizes and individualized instruction from faculty whose expertise ranges from the scientific visualization of complex molecular and anatomical structures to the creation of visual narratives for outreach and patient education. In year one, students build a foundation in illustration and visualization tools and strategies, as well as take basic and clinical science courses such as cadaveric dissection, molecular visualization, and neuroanatomy. In year two, students take a combination of both required and elective courses and work on their master's research project, a self-directed capstone project. Professional development occurs throughout the program, through critiques, workshops, and guest lectures, through formal training. In ethics and professionalism, students learn how to quote, write contracts, self-promote. They're informed on copyright, plagiarism, and artists' rights. Students tour the leading biomedical visualization studios in the world, located here in the GTA and which employ many BMC alumni. They have the opportunity to attend the industry's annual professional conference, and at the end of year two, they participate in a graduate showcase for employers. After graduation, BMC alumni pursue advanced degrees, found their own studios, and work at media and animation studios, at design consultancies that serve the health and pharmaceutical markets, at biotech startups, in hospital media departments, and in academia. The number of professional medical illustrators is small but mighty, and BMC grads benefit from a strong alumni network and from their own professional association. The Biomedical Communications Program is looking for individuals who are fascinated by and conversant in science, who are visual thinkers and creators, who have diverse and interdisciplinary backgrounds, who are excited by the idea of combining visual representation, science, and state-of-the-art technology. The minimum admission requirements for BMC include a four-year undergraduate degree with at least a mid-B in the final two years of undergraduate study, an English credit, humanities or social science credit, cell and molecular biology and or histology credit, and an intro physiology, a portfolio of visual work, three academic letters of reference, and a letter of intent. The BMC program receives between 90 and 100 applications each year for 15 to 18 positions. The average final two year GPA for successful applicants in 2020 was 3.8. For students who entered the program in 2020, 
Domestic tuition fees were $11,950, and international fees were $40,610 per year for our two-year program. Applications are submitted through the SGS online admissions application and will be accepted beginning mid-September for fall 2022 admission. And finally, for, for, for more information, please visit our website, download our brochure, or contact me. Thanks everyone for your time today. Does that complete your presentation, Maeve? Yes, I'm good. Thanks, Natasha. No problem. Um, so if Dr. Avram Gottlieb um, can, and Brandon Wells can share your screen uh, from Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology. Uh, thank you very much, Natasha. <clears throat> so Brandon and I will uh, just make this uh, brief presentation. And again, uh, I urge you uh, to go to uh, the Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology uh, website to get uh, further uh, information and, and certainly to talk to us uh, uh, for further information. So what I'm gonna present uh, briefly today is, uh, could you just go back for a sec? The Masters of Health Sciences in Laboratory Medicine, which is a program that is housed in Laboratory Medicine Pathobiology, one of the clinical departments of the Faculty of Medicine. And it's done in collaboration with uh, gynecology and obstetrics, uh, again, at the University of Toronto. And my name is uh, Avram Gottlieb. I'm the program uh, director. So next. So the first question we get asked when we're presenting is, what are these particular uh, professions that we're talking about? Because these are uh, things that uh, are, are not uh, a classic. And um, oftentimes, uh, many of our undergraduate students uh, are not aware of these professional careers. So the first is the pathologist assistants, which contribute to diagnostic services in anatomical pathology through application of knowledge of tissue and laboratory analysis of specimens. So um, that is one of the fields in our uh, program. The second field um, is clinical embryology. And these are uh, individuals who are trained to uh, contribute to clinical management via application of assisted reproductive technology in clinical embryology laboratories. So in both situations, these are people who uh, have um, a, a deep interest and, um, and um, are um, very comfortable working in the biomedical sciences and they will be uh, working in uh, clinical situations uh, in those particular sciences. Next, please. So our program, the goal is to train a pathologist assistant or a clinical embryology professionals. And the training is to understand the scientific and societal underpinning, underpinnings of their uh, respective fields and to be clinically competent and prepared for lifelong learning. So this is truly a professional program where at the end of the day, uh, you are trained either as a pathologist assistant or as a clinical embryologist. Next, please. So we have uh, several objectives in the program. The first is to understand the scientific basis and research that provide the foundation for these two professional disciplines. Uh, we want to uh, achieve the academic and applied skills required to work effectively in the discipline. So it's both um, basic science and clinical science, as well as the actual application of skill sets, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, we uh, expect our graduates to uh, gain the ability to be problem solvers, to be critical scholars, to be innovators, to be leaders, 
and to practice in a moral and ethical uh, fashion. Uh, so the program itself provides the graduates the tools to be critical self-learners, to embrace the changes in the fields as they occur as we move to precision medicine and patient-centered healthcare. And uh, last but not least is to provide a valuable student experience during the two years that you spend with us in this particular program. Next, please. So I just wanna give you uh, some idea of the program structure. Uh, and the program overall is made up of coursework and of uh, practicums and uh, simulation uh, lab work. It's a, a pretty uh, heavy program. There's a lot of material to go through in the two years, but at the end of it, you'll be well prepared to step into um, the job market. So um, the way we've structured the program is to have core courses which, um, in which both the PAs and the CE students uh, take together. And those are cell and molecular biology, biomedical research methods, clinical laboratory management, biomedical ethics, biostatistics, and a continuous uh, capstone project which is really uh, an advanced uh, research project uh, where uh, one uh, ends up writing a report and doing a, a presentation on a, a topic of interest to the given student. Uh, next, please. And then we break into the two uh, areas. The first is clinical embryology. And you can see there are a whole slew of courses which prepare you to become a clinical uh, embryologist. So there's advanced reproductive physiology giving you the basics, the background, human embryology, the same basic background. And then you get more into the technical and professional aspects of the discipline in foundations of ART, reproductive genetics, applied methods, innovations, current topics and causes and treatment of infertility, applied ART laboratory decision-making. And then we have a unique um, laboratory, which we've set up in on the sixth floor of the Medical Sciences Building, which will provide um, um, an opportunity to train in simulation labs uh, to learn the important skill sets that are required of clinical embryologists. And then we have uh, a rotation where you'll be able to go into a uh, practicing um, uh, lab to see how uh, that works. Next, please. For the pathologist assistants, again, uh, it's a, a breakdown between the basic biomedical uh, sciences and pathology and then the actual practicums doing um, work in uh, the hospital um, laboratories uh, that deal with uh, pathological specimens. So we start with basic principles of human pathobiology and pathophysiology, then anatomy and pathology of organ systems. And then we have a whole series of practicums where you move through our teaching hospitals. So you'll be at several of the teaching hospitals getting uh, hands-on one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, training uh, to handle uh, the specimens uh, as they come from the operating rooms. You'll also get uh, a practicum in autopsy pathology and you'll go up to the forensic uh, unit uh, in Toronto to spend um, a half uh, course uh, with the forensic pathologist and learn the ins and outs of forensic pathology as a PA. We also have a unique course in biobanking uh, for research, which uh, will give you that extra special training in that particular area. And uh, we've also instituted an advanced anatomy dissection so that you could go through the material um, uh, again, face-to-face, hands-on. Next. So why uh, do the Masters of Health Sciences in Laboratory Medicine uh, with us? Well, first of all, our faculty are leaders in the field across Canada and actually internationally 
uh, as well. Uh, we provide extensive career mentorship. Uh, there are five um, students admitted in each of the programs. So it's a very small group and you have um, extensive interaction with uh, these uh, leaders in the field. And uh, we set you up also with uh, networks uh, which will be very useful in both your educational experience and in finding jobs later. Uh, and then um, the, we, these networks will also um, encompass um, those who are in leadership positions in industry, academia, and hospitals and clinics. Next, please. So I do urge you, it's uh, just a brief introduction that if you want further information, go to our websites or uh, speak to us and uh, we'll be able to uh, provide you with more detailed information. The most important thing I will leave you with is uh, learn as much as you can about these uh, specialties and get a feel for whether they fit your interests and your um, uh, future goals in um, healthcare delivery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gottlieb. Um, if uh, Dr. Aaron Stiles from Medical Genomics can share your screen, that'd be great. Great, thank you, Natasha. How's that looking? Normal? Perfect. Great, thank you very much. All right, so uh, hello everybody, Natasha, thanks for that intro. I'm Aaron. I'm the director of U of G's Professional Masters in Medical Genomics program. Uh, so let's talk about medical genomics for a minute. Medical genomics basically represents the ability to understand and interpret and really harness the information that's contained in our DNA so that it can be used to help inform decisions about clinical care. And I'm sure that both your undergraduate learning and the news have probably already told you that technical and clinical advancements in what is really a relatively new field are just exploding right now. And so we know more about the human genome and about how our genetics uh, impacts our health than we ever have before. And because of how fast this field is evolving, we also know that there's this emerging need for professionals who can generate and integrate and then uh, interpret genetic and genomic data. Basically people who have been explicitly trained to keep up with the fast paced nature of the advancements in this field. And so that's really what this program is situated to provide here. So the professional masters in health sciences in medical genomics program really places our grads right at the bleeding edge of genomic medicine. And as a program, we're really oriented towards a new era of research in clinical science in which genetic and genomic data are really routinely being analyzed across an enormous range of different patient groups and different medical indications. So the program itself consists of this core set of courses across a two year duration. Generally speaking, our students take two pretty high intensity classes at a time, as well as this one longitudinal course that we're indicating across the bottom of the slide here. And one of the most exciting parts of the program is that it culminates in this fully immersive capstone practicum project. So our program has pre-existing relationships with numerous groups across the GTA and across Ontario and even some international ones. Uh, and these sites supervise our practicum students. And although the projects themselves are varied, they tend to fall into four major categories, including clinical diagnostics, clinical research, the biotech startup sphere, uh, and government agencies. And then there's always also this opportunity for our students to organize a self-directed capstone placement if they have a really specific interest that isn't reflected in our current placement partnerships. So what do our graduates do and how do they meet the new needs that we've identified in our healthcare system? We know that our grads are ideally suited for working clinical diagnostics facilities or research labs, really implementing the tools of genomic medicine and filling a major growing need in the realm of genome analysis and variant interpretation. They are very attractive to publicly funded enterprises and private companies that are generating and interpreting genomic data, either for the direct to consumer delivery or for the clinic. And we also know that they're suited to a variety of science communications roles, project management, consulting, and a whole bunch of health policy roles. 
Some of our students are already clinicians or they're well on their way to becoming clinicians. And so when those students graduate, they either go on to complete their clinical training or return to their existing clinical practice in some kind of new capacity. Some of our grads go on to pursue further education in a number of relevant fields, including pursuing PhD level studies and medical school. And then because the field is changing so much and so quickly, in addition to all these currently available positions, we also recognize that we are training students for brand new types of jobs that are only just being developed. The program is very much the first of its kind in Canada. And one of the things that makes us really special is that we're a dual stream program. So we accept students into either a clinical stream or a laboratory stream. And so in a very general sense, to enter into the clinical stream, applicants should have or should already be well on their way to obtaining one of these recognized clinical accreditations. And to enter into the lab stream, applicants should have completed a four-year BSc in a relevant discipline. So I've listed a few here that we know are a really good fit, but this is definitely not an exhaustive list and there is some flexibility here. But importantly, these two student streams move through the program as a single cohort. So I'm gonna end right here by saying that we are now accepting applications for a September 2021 start date. So if you wanna be part of something really fun that's gonna set you up for professional success in the field of genomic medicine, I would really encourage you to apply. Uh, and if you have any questions about the program, I'll be monitoring the chat in this session and you're more than welcome to email me at erin.styles at utoronto.ca or email our admin account at medicalgenomics at utoronto.ca. I would also encourage you to check out our program website at moleculargenetics.utoronto.ca slash medical genomics. And also check out our student run blog. It's called the MedGen Project and you can find it at uoftmedicalgenomics.blog.home. So that's all for me. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Dr. Stiles. Um, if uh, Dr. Helen Miliotis from Medical Physiology can share your screen, that'd be great, thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Helen Miliotis. I'm currently the director of our new Master of Health Sciences in Medical Physiology. This is a fairly new program. We are only in its first year. We took our first cohort this past September and they're moving through the program. Um, and the reason that physiology realized a need for a new professional master's program was that while there were a number of students in our research stream, a lot of them were interested in taking that new knowledge and those new discoveries and really bringing them forward to new applications. And so really our program is designed to produce people that are analysts that can interpret big data sets and understand their impact on patient care, scientists who understand innovative technologies and the commercialization process, so they wish to go down that path, or project managers that have the skills to organize diverse teams and understand either the research, business, or clinical points of view. Because when it comes to human physiology and some of the larger um, health problems, really, like obesity, for example, these are health issues that have to be tackled from multiple different perspectives. And so having people that understand multiple systems in the body, for example, and different points of view can really bring some of these research questions forward. So if you are interested in any of these careers, for example, we have a program for you. As I mentioned, the program is designed for, to address the need for graduates, to address this gap, who will be interested in the implementation of newly discovered physiology knowledge that is relevant to human health and put it into practice. So some of the core pillars of our program include big data analysis and health, for example. Many of you um, in this virtual room may have wearable devices, um, Apple watches, and so on. So who are the people that have the skill sets to be able to understand what the data actually means, but also have the technical background to analyze the data and to inform uh, clinical teams as to the impact on patient care, for example? healthcare interventions um, in terms of medical devices, commercializing new uh, products, experiences, clinical diagnostics, that all plays into clinical interventions and commercialization of physiology, as well as opportunities to train further in project management, for example, and work in large multidisciplinary teams. So we are the only one year program of its kind in Canada 
students take courses in the fall and the winter term. We have a overarching shell course, so to speak, of seminars and graduate professional development in this program. And within this uh, course shell, students have the opportunity, depending on their interest to train further. If somebody wants more data analysis skills or coding skills, they have hours allotted to learn more skills in Python, for example. If somebody wants further uh, training in project management, they can go ahead and take a project management course and so on. So students really have the opportunity through this course shell to tailor their career skills. Students also are coupled one-on-one -on -one with a faculty member in our department to write a literature review of publishable quality. So there really is this one-on-one -on -one mentorship for each and every student in our program with a current faculty member in physiology. We have a course, as I mentioned, in big data and health where students be with no previous knowledge of coding, learn how to analyze large clinically relevant data sets. We have our clinical physiology course. This is taught by clinicians from our four different platforms, um, in neurology, reproduction, endocrine, as well as cardiovascular, that come into the class and really uh, share with our students how new research and new interventions are impacting their patient care. We have a course in commercialization and collaboration in physiology where our faculty members and partners from our Rotman School of Management really come in and train students in how to write business plans and how to take an idea to market. And then we are a physiology program at its core. And so students then have the opportunity to take elective courses in physiology. Some students wish to take a number of courses from different physiology streams. Others are really interested in one particular area like neuroscience, for example, and they tailor their electives around that program area. In the summer term, our students will undergo a four month work placement. As I mentioned, we're a brand new program, um, however, for this upcoming summer, we're happy to have lined up a number of diverse uh, student practicums. I'll share with you a sample of what our students will be doing this summer. A number of them will be using that big data knowledge and working on projects that uses artificial intelligence to select either donor lungs for transplant, um, artificial intelligence in the area of assisted reproductive technologies in terms of embryos that are more suitable for implantation, machine learning for modeling of mental health and substance abuse in uh, Ontario youth, for example. Others are working with uh, startup companies that are using biometric sensing, using either wearable uh, textiles or virtual rehabilitation, virtual reality um, technology to really help in terms of brain health and cognitive impairments. Because again, our students understand the technological side, but they also have a very strong understanding in human health. Others are moving uh, to work with pharmaceutical clients in terms of healthcare learning solutions. Others are working with clinicians to commercialize diagnostic tests. And others are using some of those commercialization skills at IP offices, for example, at some of our hospitals to really begin to push some of those discoveries to market. So as you can see, different students will have different placement opportunities depending on their interests that all bring in line the core background knowledge in human health with some of these new emerging skill sets that we are training our students um, with. So applications round two, uh, we've had a round one already. So we're currently interviewing already for fall 2021. However, we are still accepting applications uh, for round two. The uh, deadline is April 19th with all documents, including references to be submitted by May 3rd, 2021. We have an email address if you have any questions and I'll put this in the chat. And then you can also sign up through this email address for email updates uh, as well from our program in terms of upcoming deadlines and any new developments. I will put the, uh, this in the chat as well as our website if you have any questions, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Miliotis. Um, if Dr. Cindy Woodland from Applied Clinical Pharmacology can share your screen, that'd be great. Thanks. Great. Hopefully you can see my screen. Okay, everyone. Well, it's a pleasure to tell you about the Applied Clinical Pharmacology this program this afternoon. It's a bit of a mouthful, so we tend to call it ACP. And it is a course-based field of study. We're actually the first course-based uh, program in the Faculty of Medicine and Life Sciences. So we are, we've been around for a while, seven years actually. And here's our website if you want further details. 
Um, so our program is a two-year program and it's kept relatively small because we really want to tailor that program to you and to what your future career goals are. In the first year of the program, you're working in interactive classroom settings uh, with your peers, really building teamwork and learning a lot about how medicines work, how our body handles medicines, and some of the reasons for the variability we see between people when they take uh, medicines. You've probably heard a lot about the drug development pathway in the past year, especially, and that's really a, a focus in our program, emphasizing the different stages and uh, what's considered at each of those different levels of drug development. So in our First, you're, you're really trying to understand the medicines and to understand some of the clinical research design. So you actually design studies, you submit research ethics protocols or mock uh, protocols. You're involved with how you would actually develop your own research project, but also how you assess different research projects and how you, for example, would prepare a CIHR grant, you write an investigator brochure, you uh, do a number of exercises that really take you through that clinical research process with the second year of the program being very experiential. So in the summer of your first year, you start an independent research project with a faculty member from the University of Toronto. It's not really restricted to somebody in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology, but you have access to all of our faculty members across campus. And you saw Rachel's aerial view of a campus. Most of our research projects are happening in hospitals, uh, places like Center for Addiction and Mental Health and other research institutes as well. And then in the second year of your program, we really encourage you to participate in a practicum. And I'm gonna come back and talk a little bit more about that, but our practicum opportunity is full time. It's generally paid employment that enables you to recap the uh, cost of your program in many cases. And you're, you're basically working in the real world, often in the pharmaceutical industry, but as you'll see later in other areas as well. So what we're focusing in on in your coursework is really developing your understanding of clinical pharmacology, drug discovery and drug development. And as I've mentioned, how clinical trials are designed and evaluated. We talk a little bit about some of the regulatory guidelines and the procedures around clinical research. And we also spend a lot of time working on your own career career preparedness and awareness. So we find a number of students who come to our program know they wanna do something related to maybe working in the pharmaceutical industry or in government with respect to how drugs are approved, uh, perhaps in medical communications, but they're not really aware of all of the different roles that are available to them. And so we spend time bringing people in to talk to you about what they do on a daily basis. And you get a, an idea from the networking that we have uh, kind of what it's like to work in different areas and that enables you to make a better informed decision about where you'd like to go with your degree in applied clinical pharmacology. We actually have a course that forces you to kind of get out there and network a little bit where you are doing that cold calling that Rory was referring to. Um, we certainly introduce you to people, but we do encourage you to have informational interviews and to practice with behavioral interviews. We work with you on how to best tailor a cover letter and resume to particular positions and to really develop your skills for not only applying for positions, but how you will perform when you're in those positions. So we emphasize critical thinking, obviously, and data analysis, problem solving, effective scientific communication. And we have something called ACP teams, where throughout our program, you'll work in groups of four, and those groups will rotate throughout the program. Uh, and you'll basically learn about different roles within teams and focus on your professional development um, through practice. And as I mentioned, a lot of networking opportunities. Our program requires you to take eight courses, and that translates to six full course equivalents, and you have two full course equivalents for elective courses. Your elective courses don't need to be in pharmacology per se. They could be in areas that are applicable to clinical pharmacology. So for example, some of our students want to strengthen their knowledge of biomedical statistics, or they want to participate in coursework that involves a particular area of pharmacology, or um, maybe even a physiology course that prepares them for their area of interest in study. 
Um, our breadth requirements uh, or our, our elective uh, courses are quite broad in breadth. So some people want pharmaceutical strategy. Some people want to know about um, areas of addiction, for example. And we package all of that knowledge and skills together to prepare you for this second year where you have your experiential learning. So before I talk about that year in particular, I just want to remind you that graduate school should be more of a journey than, you know, just being focused on the destination. And we really do try to encourage you to have a lot of fun in graduate school. We have a lot of extracurricular activities. And I want you to be mindful of making that graduate experience um, very rich and fulfilling because you often really expand your social and professional networks in these programs. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun and you should really try to get involved in as many opportunities as possible. And there are things on campus where there are um, groups you can participate in where you're doing case studies related to the pharmaceutical industry, for example, and we encourage you to participate in those. Obviously, at the University of Toronto, uh, you have an opportunity uh, with that MSc uh, to pull on the reputation when you are applying to positions and to really think about what transferable skills you're developing through your program. So I'll just show you some of the career opportunities. Students that participate in a practicum are often interested in working in the pharmaceutical industry or contract research organizations involved with clinical research. Some of our students are, and increasingly so, very interested in medical communications and how we are able to convey scientific information effectively. Uh, some of our students want to work with government and there are opportunities at the federal, the provincial and even the municipal levels uh, to get involved with some of the work going on there. So I wasn't able to fit all of the companies that uh, work with us for our practica, but our practica are either four or eight months in length. And some companies actually offer a one year internship that students participate in. And we find that most of our students actually end up working for these companies after their practicum. So we've put the practicum at the very end of our program so that you can seamlessly transition into full time employment when you graduate. And these are there are many different opportunities. A lot of our students are interested in clinical research, as I've mentioned, and being a clinical research professional or being a clinical study professional where they're uh, looking at how studies are actually operating and working on various uh, aspects there, working in study startup, working in market access. Uh, so there's a, variety, a wide variety of careers that you can go to from this program. And we'll talk to you throughout the program. We meet with each student uh, and really several times actually, and, and really get to know you well and to decide how to help you best on your career journey. So I've just listed here what you need to apply to the program. You do not need to have a background in pharmacology. However, if you don't have a background in pharmacology, we will work with you in that summer before you start your program, just to advise you on some reading you might like to do, because it is a fairly steep learning curve in September when you haven't had any background in pharmacology. And so we give you some materials to um, prepare for that and some online modules to just assist you in that transition if you're worried about that. Uh, and you know, you can come from a variety of life sciences backgrounds usually, but we do try to emphasize uh, having some strength in physiology and also biochemistry. You can see our recommendations uh, here. We do require uh, transcripts from all of the universities that you have attended. And we do advise you to submit reference letters from people not only who know you well, but to have at least two academic references. If you've been working, sometimes we have people who've been working at Health Canada or in the pharmaceutical industry and come back to take our program. You're welcome to include uh, letters from your employment there, but we do look for a minimum of two academic letters. And as well, we have a personal statement where we're really getting to know you. We read each of these statements. So it's an opportunity to explain anything that you're uncomfortable with, for example, on your transcript or um, what your, your goals are and what you're really trying to get out of the program uh, so that we can best you know, tailor the program, as I said, to your individual interests. Here are deadlines and you've got our website here and I'm happy to take any questions at the end of the session. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Woodland. If uh, Sarah McMahon from Physical Therapy can share your screen, that'd be great, thanks. Thanks, Natasha. Um, so I'm the Student Liaison Officer in the Department of Physical Therapy, and I'm going to talk to you today about um, 
the Master of Science in Physical Therapy program, which is a professional master's program that is two years in length. So for those of you who aren't overly familiar with physical therapy, um, it is a self-regulated health profession. Um, and the idea behind physical therapy is uh, to prevent, diagnose, and treat um, various movement dysfunctions. Uh, and there's a variety of different ways that physical therapists do this. Uh, so for example, um, exercise, education, consultation, and so forth. Physical therapy is um, kind of unique because it's uh, practiced across the entire continuum of healthcare. So it's not just um, like acute healthcare, but also long-term chronic care. Um, people work in private practice, sports, um, rehabilitation. So there's lots of different areas you can go into within uh, the healthcare field. Um, PTs also work across the entire lifespan, meaning right from neonatal right up to end of life care. Um, and they work across all body systems. So um, MSK, the musculoskeletal, neurological, cardio rest, um, and also uh, multi-system multi uh, comorbidity. So having said that, I think most people are probably familiar with the MSK, the musculoskeletal PTs. So this, this would be if you you know, you had a sports injury or something and you went to a PT to help you get your, your function back. Um, but PTs work in a lot of different areas beyond just sports injuries. Um, so think about people with asthma who have trouble breathing. Um, they can see a PT to help with, um, you know, strengthening their diaphragm, increasing their lung capacity. So there's lots of different, um, and that's just one example, but there's lots of different areas that PTs work in. Um, even, you know, concussion, um, people who've had concussions as well often see PTs. Um, so lots of different fields of, of um, practice you can go into here. And then, of course, if you wanted, you could also go into um, more of a health promotion domain. So having, having said all of that, um, some examples of roles that PTs take. Um, Many of them are clinicians, meaning they work in a hospital or they work in a private practice setting uh, where they see patients. Uh, PTs can be researchers. Uh, they can work as administrators, um, educators, uh, mentioned health promotion already, uh, advocates and consultants. So there's lots of different career opportunities for PTs right now. Uh, and the job market is very, very good for PTs as well. Um, you will find work as a PT in Ontario right now. So why study PT specifically at U of T? Um, well, first I'll mention that the program is fully accredited. And what that means is when you finish the program, you will be allowed to write your licensing exam. And you can't practice physiotherapy anywhere in Canada until you pass the licensing exam. So look for a program that's fully accredited. That's really important. The U of T's is fully accredited, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, I mentioned before, it is a two-year full-time program. Um, we have a, re a recently renewed curriculum, uh, which I'll show you a little bit about later. Um, and we have over 200 um, clinical teaching facilities, uh, many of them in downtown. So that's where you would go if you were doing um, placements with a clinician. All right, so I'll talk just a couple of minutes about how you get in. Um, so we are going to ask for uh, an undergraduate degree with a high academic standing, uh, at least a mid B in the last year. But um, as Rory mentioned, some of the programs have uh, higher minimum requirements. And in this particular program, uh, if you want to be competitive, you really will need about an A minus to an A in the last two years of study. Okay, we specifically look at the last two years of study uh, to calculate your GPA. So we call it a sub GPA. Uh, the last couple of years, the cutoff has been hovering around a 3.8. It fluctuates a little bit uh, from one year to the next, but that's an A, uh, A minus. So as I said, to be competitive, you are gonna need fairly high grades in the last two years of your studies. 
Um, and then I'll mention too, in terms of bachelor's degrees, what do we take? Um, pretty much anything is fine, as long as it's in liberal arts and sciences. Um, we have lots of people that come in with kinesiology backgrounds. Um, we have lots of people come in with life science backgrounds, health science backgrounds. Um, we have usually a few that come in with some kind of a BA. Uh, the only thing that isn't really appropriate would be uh, some of the fine arts, um, things like drama, dance, um, things with like practicum components uh, or, or things with performance components like music. Those ones generally wouldn't be appropriate, but almost everything else is okay. Um, if you're not sure, you can always ask us. We do have some additional prerequisite courses that we ask all applicants to make sure they've completed. Um, and those include physiology, anatomy, stats or research methods, life or physical sciences, social science, humanity, or a language. Um, and you do have to have at least a 70% or a B minus in all of these courses in each of them to make sure um, that you're well prepared for the rigor of this program. We also uh, have been requiring applicants over the last few years to complete um, something called the CASPER. Uh, CASPER is just uh, the name of this test. It's an online situational judgment test. Uh, you can complete it from anywhere as long as you've got internet access. Um, and it essentially measures soft skills. So things that you would need to be well-versed in if you're gonna succeed as a clinician. So things like empathy, communication, um, ethics, that sort of thing. So everybody has to write that. And like every other SGS program, you're gonna need reference letters. Um, so we ask for one academic reference letter. So this would be from somebody who, um, for example, has taught you a course like a professor uh, and one professional reference. So this could be um, an employer. It could be somebody that you volunteered with, um, somebody who can speak to you uh, and, and your performance and activities outside of school. The last thing I'm gonna talk about that's part of our admissions process is called the CAP. Um, it stands for Computer Administered Profile. Um, this is kind of like our interview process. It's an online um, test. You would type all your answers in. Um, it is timed. The, the questions will be similar to what you'd see if you were in an interview. Um, and this one is only by invitation. So what we'll do um, is we'll invite just our top applicants to come in and write this. Uh, and I'll show you exactly what I mean here. So the first thing we do is we look at the CASPER scores. So those are the online situational judgment test scores. Then we look at your academics and your reference letters. And we select the top 300 to 350 people um, to come and, or I shouldn't say come, but to actually go online and write our CAP test. Um, and then we give everybody a rank. Okay. So that's kind of the process, how we move through this in our admissions process. Um, I'm going to put our contact information up here. If you've got any questions, um, you can email us or give us a call. Um, our website is up there too. We have a lot of information up there about the process prerequisites. Uh, we also have an FAQ page. I know I went through this really, really quickly today, um, but do have a look on the website if you're interested in applying. Um, and if you've got any questions, send us an email. We're happy to chat. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sarah. If uh, Aleem Lalani from Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy can share your screen, that'd be great. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm here to speak with you about uh, occupational science and occupational therapy. So similar to physical therapy, it's a rehabilitation science. Um, it's a two-year master's program. And what do occupational therapists do? And we call them OTs as an occupational therapist. They help people uh, return to their meaningful activities, regardless of their, um, their physical or mental abilities uh, or limitations. Uh, ideally, an OT would come up with a, uh, a meaningful solution to allow that person to return to their activities. And that activity can be anything. It can be playing the piano. It can be programming software. It could be 
uh, throwing a baseball. It can be anything that makes someone whole. So let me first talk about the program. So again, it's, it's two years full time. You're going to be taking 14 courses across uh, six terms. We offer it at the St. George and Mississauga campus. It is accredited, of course. Um, we have a very high pass rate for our national certification exam. And in Ontario, um, you need to be uh, registered with the College of Occupational Therapists of Ontario. So that's just like the how doctors and nurses all have their own professional associations to be registered with. Occupational therapists have the same thing. So where do OTs work? You probably not, have not noticed this, but they're everywhere. They're in private industry. They're in the school system, uh, government, assistive devices, mental health. They're in a variety of spots. Now, why U of T? Um, as many of the presenters have mentioned already, uh, there is an extremely good research program here. Um, we, our department has 25 core faculty, um, hundreds of clinical faculty, so they will teach you job ready skills in the field. Um, our own facilities have, um, have uh, did somebody actually mute their, their screen? I'm sorry, someone has, a, uh, has their audio on. Thank you. Um, now, there are over 100 placement sites within the U of T catchment area. Uh, and what catchment means is that that's the area where you can do your clinical field work placement. So uh, there are a lot of placements. Uh, so, for example, we have students at the University Health Network Hospital. We have students at the Toronto FC Football Club. Um, they are anywhere and everywhere. So within the program itself, you start off with a foundational year. Um, and you, you're taking between five and seven courses per term and it's full-time only. So you take all these courses in theory, assessment, mental health, technology, structure and function is a fancy way of saying anatomy. Um, then in the second year of the program, you actually go into applied courses where the courses are uh, tailored around the person's age and the person being the client, not you. So that would be a course uh, that deals with um, uh, care of, of children, a course that works with adults and a course that works with older adults. And there's a part one and part two of each one of those courses. There's also a graduate research project so that if you wanted to do a PhD at some point, you could piggyback off of that graduate research project. But of course, being a master's degree program, uh, research is essential no matter what. Uh, Fieldwork experience, which is the part that most people find uh, the fun part about the program, uh, over a thousand hours of clinical fieldwork. Um, we have expanded our telehealth options as well. So we're training people in sort of virtual healthcare for one of the placements. Um, but of course, the options are limitless. They're in mental health and physical health. Um, they're in private industry and public industry. And of course, we uh, do something called professional so socialization. So what that means is that um, we treat you like a professional when you're in the program. And we set you up with a mentor. We set you up with a faculty advisor. We set you up with a research supervisor in your second year of the program. And we permit student uh, involvement, leadership involvement on committees. So for example, we have a diversity and inclusion committee. We have a student affairs committee. We have a curriculum committee. So there's lots of places for students to get involved. So an example of some of the research projects students do in the second year of the program are listed here. I wanna actually draw your attention to number four and number five, robotics and rehab and aging at home with AI assistive technology. That's artificial intelligence. So um, one of our um, distinguished professors in the program, uh, he, his name is Alex uh, Mihalidis, and uh, he has pioneered uh, technology uh, and rehabilitation services, uh, products, research. And um, he has, of course, trained many graduate students over the years. And as such, now those instructors are with us. Uh, we have one professor, Rosalie Wang, who teaches our technology course right now, who, who um, is an expert in this field. And um, there's opportunity for students to get involved in, um, in uh, technology conferences, uh, research that involves tech, uh, and sort of working in non-traditional fields. So you don't necessarily go work in a hospital anymore. But there are uh, job opportunities these days in, in firms that deal with, um, with artificial intelligence technology. So again, these aren't necessarily healthcare service firms, but they're looking to expand in those areas. I've mentioned about the fieldwork program. So um, the idea of the fieldwork program is that it starts off uh, in your first fieldwork placement being a little easier. They're a little more tame about things. Um, and you're meant to just more observe things on your first fieldwork placement. And that intensity increases as you get to fieldwork two, three, and four. So fieldwork four would take place right before you, you finish the program, right before you graduate. Uh, and that one, you would effectively be an OT in practice, but of course you'll have a supervisor in the field. So they, they do a sort of gradual intensity as, as time goes on. So you're not being thrust into something you're not ready for. 
campus assignment. So should you pick St. George or Mississauga? Well, we send out a survey after you apply. Um, that survey goes out usually around February, the application deadline being January. And you can, you can indicate your preference, but the preferences aren't guaranteed. To be honest, if you really want OT, uh, I'm not sure why you necessarily have a preference unless you have some burning need to live in a particular spot. Um, maybe you want to live closer to your, your parental home, but other than that, the programs are the same quality across both campuses. The Mississauga campus cohort is a smaller cohort. Other than that, there's really no difference aside from the geographic location. Academic requirements are similar to what Sarah mentioned for physical therapy. We're looking for that appropriate bachelor's degree, and that can be almost anything. I can tell you the admissions committee um, does not necessarily see degrees in performance areas like uh, fine arts, um, fine arts being like drawing, sculpting, artwork, um, and uh, music. Those two are generally ineligible, um, but you can of course contact us if you have uh, liberal arts or science coursework within that program uh, to um, supplement your application. Ideally, you're going to have an A minus average, and we use the term sub GPA, and that's just a nice way of saying uh, your, your last uh, 10 full course equivalents, so your last two years if you're on a full-time basis. Um, we don't have prerequisites in occupational therapy, but we do recommend some prior study in those areas mentioned here simply because um, you may find coursework a little bit easier in the program if you have those courses. During the application process, we ask for a personal statement submission. Um, a resume, and two reference letters. Now, this is a uh, last year's set of dates, but they've been effectively the same set of dates for the last decade or so. Typically around mid-May is when offers of admission are uh, posted. ORPASS is the Ontario University's Application Center Rehabilitation Wing. So they have a whole bunch of rehab programs on this subsection of their website that you can apply through. Um, and of course, campus assignments will be noted on that day. So here's an example of a successful applicant profile. Most of our class comes from a science background, but a big chunk still comes from a liberal arts background. Ideally, it's a four-year university degree. You have, you've had some exposure to the profession of OT, so you've made an informed career choice. So what that means is that if on your application you describe this excellent placement at a physiotherapy clinic, that's great, but you haven't actually seen OT. You've seen rehabilitation, but you haven't seen OT. So ideally, you would have some exposure to the profession of OT, and that doesn't necessarily have to be something that you volunteer for. It can be something you've done over internet research, uh, reviewing videos or curriculum, um, any sort of academic journals, those all count as exposure. Um, ideally, you'd have that A average or A minus average, and typically it's the top 10% of applicants who receive admission. So how to apply? I mean, this was last year's deadline, January 8th. I suspect the deadline for 2022 is going to be the same. Um, again, you send everything to this University Application Center website, and uh, we'll take it from there. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. There's my human contact information. That is not an automated email. That is a real person behind that email. So send me an email with any of your questions. I'd be happy to respond. Thank you, Alim. Um, if Adrian, Adriana Dragomir from Speech Language Pathology can share your screen. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. My name is Adriana Dragomir. Um, I am the Student Affairs Administrator in the Department of Speech and Pathology, and today I will give you a brief overview um, of uh, the Master of Health Information um, Science in um, Speech Language Pathology. Um, speech Language Pathology was established at the University of Toronto in 1958, um, so our program is over 60 years old. A master's degree was established in 1980. And a Master of Science, so a research stream program, and a PhD were established in 1995. Um, so we have three programs in fact um, in speech language pathology, the, masters, uh, the Master of Health Science, um, which is the professional program, a Master of Science and a Doctor of Philosophy, which live under the umbrella of the Rehabilitation Sciences Institute. And these are research programs. What is speech language pathology? So for those of you who have not had contact with speech language pathologists before, uh, whether through um, your own personal situation or um, somebody you know, um, a speech um, language pathologist is an autonomous professional who has expertise in 
development and disorders of communication swallowing and um, also in the assessment and intervention for these areas. Speech language pathologists are clinicians. They also teach, um, they manage, um, they're sometimes their own private practices. They carry out research and um, they work in rural and urban centers across Canada. And uh, they're, they're equally committed to research and to public education. Um, and they're very um, interconnected as a profession and with a very strong history and interest in mentoring new graduates and providing support to um, alumni. Where do speech and pathologists work? Um, they're pretty much everywhere, um, in hospitals, in schools, for example, for children, where they support children who have speech impediments, in hospitals where they um, carry out um, uh, clinical work in support of various um, 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 difficulties that, that people have after, for example, having accidents or strokes um, or uh, you know, where there's a need for support for somebody who has uh, dementia and cannot swallow or somebody who has had um, cancer and has difficulty swallowing and speaking and so on. And um, so, so the opportunities for work are really um, very many. Um, we have rehabilitation centers um, I already mentioned private practices. Many of the uh, alumni uh, have their own practice, which gives them a lot of flexibility and the opportunity to also interact uh, with, with other um, professions. Um, um, they, they teach at universities and um, they also work in various research facilities. Um, what does the curriculum in our, pro uh, in our program look uh, like? Um, our program is 22 months old. It consists of five academic units and four clinical units, uh, which we also call placements. Um, and what's very specific to our program is that each academic unit is followed by a clinical placement in the same area. So what you learn in, in, um, in class is reinforced uh, through um, the clinical placement. Um, we also, our program also features a, um, what we call capsule portfolio, which is a reflection piece uh, in which you demonstrate competence in um, the eight department of growth and objectives. Some of the innovative features of the program are the integrated learning experiences. I already mentioned the academic and clinical modules and how they're integrated. Um, we offer teaching clinics uh, during clinical placements, evidence-informed practice focus. I mentioned the CAPSA portfolio. And um, last but not least, the interprofessional education curriculum, in which um, professionals from many fields collaborate to help uh, strengthen your education in the program. And um, some of the, the, the programs um, that uh, work with us um, in support of this are dentistry, kinesiology, physical education, um, medical radiation, medicine, nursing, OT, pharmacy, physician assistant, physical therapy, and social work. So this is a highly interdisciplinary field. And you not only receive strong training, but you also learn how to collaborate with professions, um, with other professions to create, help create the best care possible for your clients. Um, our faculty carry out groundbreaking research. Um, they're, they're amazing researchers and they're amazing faculty, they're amazing teachers as well. It's a close knit community. Um, it's a small department. Everybody knows everybody and there's a lot of support. Uh, from both faculty and alumni, and you collaborate closely with your, with your um, colleagues. So there's a very strong sense of community in our department. Our, our alumni association is, is very supportive 
to both um, awards and also as acknowledgements and also as mentors for, um, for our students. Um, it's a full-time program that lasts uh, for 22 months. We only have one intake in September. The application deadline is early January each year for um, the September admission. And we admit 60 students uh, per year. The admission requirements um, are also public. These are also published on our website. We ask for a four year um, undergraduate degree or equivalent and a minimum of a need be spending in the final year of undergraduate study. Sorry. And um, we also ask for a number of prerequisite courses in which you must have a B plus standing. Uh, we ask for half courses in child development, genetics, general linguistics, statistics, and research methods. And we ask for a full course in human physiology. We also ask for two academic reference letters. And under normal circumstances, we also ask for a clinical um, letter. Um, the clinical component this, um, for the current admission cycle has been waived. Uh, due to the difficulties that uh, our applicants have encountered in obtaining clinical experience because of the situation. Um, so in addition to this, we only ask for a letter of intent. Uh, we don't know yet whether we will be waiving the clinical component uh, for next year as well. It's highly possible. Um, so what you would really be looking at in applying would be a degree, uh, with the proper grades, the prerequisite courses, academic letters, and a letter of intent. Please keep your uh, an eye on our website. Uh, we will be posting um, any updates as soon as we make the decisions. Um, this is a program that you, you will be paying for. Uh, with that said, we, we do have a healthy fund of awards and bursaries. Uh, we also strongly encourage you to uh, apply uh, for the entire graduate scholarship, which is uh, a very, very good opportunity to support your, your tuition and also have some money um, left. Um, so if you have good grades and you apply to a program, make sure to apply to um, uh, the entire graduate scholarship. Um, the deadline is mid-March. Um, should you wish to read more about our program, please visit um, www.slp.uchanter.ca. And should you wish to contact me, slp.studentaffairs at uchanter.ca. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your attention today. Thank you, Adriana. Um, if uh, Dr. Joseph Ehrenbach and Dr. Richard Foley from Translational Research Program can share your screen and let me know if you want me to share the poll. All right, um, hopefully you can see the PowerPoint. Yep. Yeah, we're good. Hi, everybody. Uh, Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Joseph. Uh, thank you for giving us the chance to talk. This is my uh, we have two colleagues here, actually. They're going to introduce themselves now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Richard Fodi. I'm one of the faculty members of the TRP. And, and I'm Jana Neyman Zenovich, and I'm the program officer at the TRP. So we like to do things a little bit differently. So we showed up with more than one person. We're going to do this collaboratively because that's sort of kind of what our program is about. Um, so we're going to start with why think about us, why the translational research program. And that's because uh, we are looking for people like you. And if you want to challenge uh, yourself to learn differently, then you should probably think about talking to us. Um, and so let's start with this. This is a square. Um, it, well, Hopefully we can agree it's a square. Um, let me ask you this. Um, how many possible ways can you divide this square into four equal parts? Uh, Rich, if you can pull up our poll. Uh, actually, I'm gonna pass this over to Natasha because Natasha's got the poll and she can do it. Okay, whoever's doing <laughs> the poll. I'll do the poll right now. 
Okay, so this is active engagement, everybody. So we've been sitting here for, for a little over an hour now, and there's 96 of us. So we actually want you to try this. Okay, draw out the square if you want, you know, break it into however you think it'll look. But how many ways do you think you can divide this into four equal parts? Because think about it, we're, we're graduate school and training programs. We are about learning. We're here, we're gonna learn. How many parts can you see? Okay, it's getting there. 38 people responding, 40. Oh, come on. We're not asking you to turn on your cameras here. It's getting there. We're at 50. <laughs> 50. Okay. I can live with 50%. 60. Okay, 60. No, not 50%. This is, a 50, this is people. Yeah, but there's about 100. So, yeah. okay. So what are we looking at? I don't see it with our with our with the way the screen is. Yeah, give it a second because it's we're actually we're at 80% of people that have voted now and it's pretty close. So the majority of people say four to seven, 38% of them are four to seven. Uh, the next one is 32% uh, of them said 16 plus. Uh, and then 20% uh, said zero to three and 11% said eight to 15. Okay, great. Thank you everyone okay, for participating. The poll. You oh, can make a poll. Now you Perfect. can see it. Okay. We're not going to talk about the answer just now. Oh, now I can see it. Okay, well, well, that's great. Okay, but the majority of you are basically under eight. Fair to say? Okay. Sure. We're going to talk about the square, but we're not going to talk about the square. We're going to talk about ways of thinking about this problem of figuring out the square. See, there are different ways of thinking, and a typical approach is to say, hey, okay, let's draw a line down the center. Now, there are different ways you can draw lines, up and down, uh, horizontally. Uh, you can draw them from one axis to the other. And in this case, you have at least two different ways. Now, that's one way of thinking. That's sort of the, the typical approach, probably that popped into your head because we're all sort of trained to recognize these kinds of shapes. Now there's another way of thinking. Let's think about this systematically. What can we do to this square to solve the problem? Well, one way we can look at the square is we can apply a grid to it and systematically look at ways of separating the grid into four different pieces. So one would be columns. So now we come up with columns, uh, the Tetra shape, whatever that is. Um, that's another way that we can break up this grid. Um, again, another Tetris, actually, most of these are Tetris. They're all Tetris. Yeah. They're all Tetris. <laughs> <laughs> and this um, slide, yeah. So, but even within the Tetris, there are different ways of orienting it. So now, instead of the two ways of thinking about this problem, we have four solutions plus the two we had before, the Tetris. But this approach, the Tetris approach, unfortunately, actually precludes one of the other approaches. So it doesn't have pyramids or diamonds or other things. So again, this way of thinking may not be the only way of thinking. So what are the alternative ways of thinking? Well, squiggly lines, curved lines, as long as you're filling the requirements of the problem, four equal areas, four equal parts, there are actually an, almost an infinity of ways of breaking up this square. What's the difference? In the way you think about the problem. What's our purpose? Our purpose is to challenge students to think differently, to improve health, medicine, and care. So why the TRP? What do we have to offer? What we do is we help our students learn creative problem solving strategies and competencies to establish your career trajectories or change your career trajectories. We teach you to think so that you can apply these skills and competencies, not just after you graduate, but after you graduate and after your next gig and after that and after that. 
to look at creative opportunities and to expand your skills. And so what does this practically mean? Well, our students do stuff. So for example, they participate or are involved in things like TR Talks, where they talk to experts and groups of people about topics like device uh, uh, approvals, uh, drug pathways, social policy. How do we solve these big problems and big thoughts? Our students take initiative. Our students this year formed the ARC Anti-Racism Committee, and they're working on currently developing a new module for within the program and hopefully for others to think about ways of inclusive uh, design and inclusive thinking. Um, our students just recently launched a new podcast, The Impact Gap, in order to give patients a, a voice and a perspective uh, in our healthcare system. And our students look at different types of technologies and approaches. Uh, way back when, a few years back, we've looked into uh, mediated AR, VR approaches in, in research and medicine. Rich? So you might be thinking, what is translation? We hear this word a lot. It's become a little bit of a buzzword. And this is our sixth year into the program. So we've seen the buzzword develop over time. Translation, very, very simply, is the process of applying knowledge, okay? If you read the, the definition here, is what we're trying to do. But the TRP focus is not only on applying the knowledge, we need to know what our target is. Why are we doing this? We spend a lot of time focusing on the why, and that comes down oftentimes to the patient. Okay, if we're trying to help people, we're trying to improve health and medicine and care, then we need to understand what people need help with. And the only way to do that is to talk to them to understand them. If you can fundamentally understand the problem, then the answer becomes pretty self-evident. But we're trained, and it's just human nature, to jump to see a problem and go, okay, we're going to go straight to the answer. We know what the answer is. Let's do it. And if we do that and we do it too quickly, and we don't understand what the problems are, then we end up finding solutions to non-existent problems. So the TRP is about navigating the complexities of health innovation navigating the requirements through creative problem solving, figuring out how to have impact on patients. And the way we do this is through self-directed learning, uh, pr uh, problem-based and case-based learning. So we, uh, Jana leads our case studies in our, in our program, for example. Um, we focus on the formation of knowledge and its application rather than assessing whether you've memorized something. And we look at reflection and um, experiential learning. So it's about hands-on, uh, trying things, doing stuff. And we assess and we work on competencies that you've heard some of the other programs also uh, um, talk about, creativity, problem solving, effective communication, leadership. These are all things that you need in your professional and career, and you get through our program as well in as you learn how to problem solve and think about improving innovation. Um, Jenna, would do you want to talk about this one by any chance? You don't have to. <laughs> sure. Um, so in our second year program is usually is two year program, and in the second year, our students do something which you've heard before from other classes programs, um, a capstone project. And our capstone projects have real impact. And this is one of the um, capstone projects that a previous uh, group has done. And what they looked at is they looked at a condition called incontinence um, in children. And this is when children cannot control their urine or fecal matter. And in about 1% of these children, um, they will not be, respond to typical treatment. So they'll go into something called refractory incontinence. And what this group found is that there is an alternative treatment that has been successfully used in adults in Canada, but hasn't been done in children. So what they did is they set up a pilot project or pilot study at SickKids, and they brought this treatment to children at at this time, as, 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 as far as I know, it's quite successful. It, it's tre a treatment that children want and has been very successful at treating refractory incontinence. So our caps and projects, real projects, real impact and uh, immediate impact. Another one here, uh, invasive placentation uh, involved a, 
our students come from all over. So actually uh, there was a clinician, uh, an engineer, and um, I forget what Connor's background was. Uh, I think it was health science, but he worked in 3D space printing sort of from industry. Um, so uh, our students are very different. We have students in their mid twenties and students in their mid sixties. Uh, we have students that are start just finishing up their graduate our undergraduate degrees and then students that are MD PhDs or clinicians in other areas. Um, the thing that unites them is that they want to learn how to take initiative, how to work collaboratively, how to solve complex problems and have tangible impact on people's health. Um, our courses uh, are on online. I don't, um, it's a two-year program. Jen, is there anything in particular you wanna mention? No, no. so first year is a course-based. Uh, usually it's just courses in the first year. In the second year, you have a chance to do a capstone project. Uh, and a, our capstones are usually done in groups. Our program is collaborative and they're, um, we don't lecture at you. I guess you mentioned that. We, there are no midterms or exams. There are mostly group projects, presentations, and reports. Um, and then these are the courses that we offer, but you can find us more on our website and I'll post it in the chat. And because our students are quite different and are looking for very different things, the outcomes are also very different. Um, so we've had graduates go into industry, research, government, uh, um, academe, PhDs, uh, even startup consulting companies or their own startups. Uh, our requirements are also on our website, but they're pretty typical from what you've heard before here. Um, our application is pretty typical. And again, if you reach out and talk to us, if you're a good fit, we'd love to talk to you. Um, we have rolling admissions, so we're already in the process of recruiting, but uh, our domestic students march oh i thought it was uh this is oh, oh for, for anyone is interested in applying for the ontario graduate scholarship uh our domestic students and international are eligible because you're doing a capstone project um the international deadline has passed but the domestic deadline is march 1st so if you are considering applying for this award please apply to our program and the award simultaneously um, so basically, if this is of any interest, uh, if you are uh, looking for a, a way to explore and pivot and find ways to establish yourself, learn how to problem solve work in different areas, um, set up a consult, you can go to our website, trp.utoronto.ca, and you can book a consult with uh, a faculty uh, or uh, one of our core members and just talk about the fit. I think that's for us is the most important. Um, we do uh, look at your grades and your references and your letter of intent as part of a balanced holistic approach for um, assessing the fit of, to, within our program. Look forward to any questions and comments you might have. Okay, we'll share that at the end. We just have one more presenter. Uh, thank you, Joseph, Jana, and Richard. Um, we can have uh, Stacey Houston from Genetic Counseling share your screen, and this is our last presenter before questions. Yep. Give me whoop. one second here. Whoops, I was just giving another talk so you can see my <laughs> different background here. Um, uh, welcome everyone. Can you, uh, can you see my slides appropriately? Let me just see. There we go. I am Stacey Houston. I'm the um, program director for the Gen Counseling Program at uh, U of T. Stacey, you're in presenter mode right now. We can uh, am I? You. Okay, hold on, thank you. How's that? That's better. Perfect. Um, so genetic counselors um, have specialized training in medical genetics and counseling in order to help individuals and families make decisions about their health. This can include interpreting genetic results and, and helping support patients and families looking for information about how genetic conditions can be inherited or how it might affect them or their families. And genetic counselors work in a variety of clinical setting, settings, many shown here, which include pediatrics, um, prenatal diagnosis and oncology, which is a large um, group of um, 
for, for current counselors working in, um, in healthcare. Many counselors also can work in laboratories or in research or in private industries. And so currently there are five uh, genetic counseling programs in Canada with U of T being one of the second oldest programs with our first class graduating over 20 years ago. Our program is a full-time degree program that prepares students both with the academic knowledge and uh, clinical skills so that upon graduating, you can work in, as a highly genetic, competent genetic counselor in a variety of clinical areas. So uh, for both year one and year two, there's a combination of courses, didactic work um, taught by um, professionals in the field and, and tailored to the genetic counseling um, student, as well as clinical um, rotations that begin in year one with more of an observational role, um, observational clinic, which this year we changed to a little bit of a practice-based learning um, format. And then our clinical sites are a variety of the um, downtown hospitals, as well as some of the other um, uh, centers around the city, which would support a large variety of our um, clinical learning for our students and many which obviously are um, um, focused downtown, which allow for easy access to many of the clinical sites for students. In year one, in the second semester, students develop, um, are, are allowed to do hands-on rotations. Then they begin to slowly develop their skills in seeing various clinical situations and um, rotating with various different genetic counselors and different genetic um, conditions. The courses also um, supplement their learning and include various guest, guest speakers from our leaders in the U of T community and include discussions both of ethical and professional issues that are important for our um, clinical practice. Um, this is a non-thesis master's program and students develop and complete an independent research project of their choice. Uh, year two, the clinical rotations um, involve increasing clinical responsibility so that um, the students develop counseling competencies under supervision, and they have the opportunity for a four-week four -week elective in a variety of different fields, um, including both clinical and non-clinical options. Summer placement is encouraged um, at a site outside of our program to provide different learning opportunities and networking options. The application requires a written response to three questions, um, description of the relevant experience, which often experience involves sort of active uh, counseling experience, like on a hotline or distress line, um, and potentially some shadowing of a genetic um, clinic, but that's not a requirement for our um, for admission. Um, and certainly we try to take a holistic approach that it's not just marks, but all areas of the application um, that we review. Here's a, just a slide about our fees. And then um, certainly some of the highlights is we do have a scholarship for both new and, and returning students. Um, we are able to um, provide unique experience with uh, diverse patient populations. And our um, graduates have all, all got jobs within about six months of um, uh, graduation in a variety of positions that include um, those listed here. And our rotations are within walking distance, they're easily accessible. Here's our main line. If you have any certain any further questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks. Thank you, Stacy, um, for presenting. So that is the end of all our presentations. I'm going to take the next, I guess, 10 minutes or so to answer any questions if the presenters can, I guess, open up your video. And if um, the participants can, you know, uh, unmute yourself or put in the chat your questions. Or if any if any of the presenters have anything else to share as well. Um, so I see a question in the chat for me about um, embryology. So so many um, students don't have embryology as a as a 
availability at their undergraduate, um, and many students take an online on embryology course, many through the University of Cincinnati, um, which we certainly accept. Anyone else? see one more in the chat. Um, the, the minimum, G I guess we don't have a sort of maybe posted minimum GPA for genetic counseling. It's certainly a very competitive program. Many students have um, a, a very high average, but certainly, again, we're looking holistically at the um, applicants to include experience and their uh, references and the biographical sketch um, in order to pick our class. Uh, for Amanda, you, we usually have a research-based presentation in the fall, around October, November. For any master's program, if I were to take a gap year or two, would this have a negative impact on my application? How would, how will about previously failed? If anyone can answer that. So if I can jump in on that, because they're two very different questions. Um, I don't think that most master's programs would look negatively on a gap year. But as I mentioned in my uh, presentation, uh, a gap year can cause trouble for you if you are looking for references. Uh, so if you decide to take a couple of years off between undergrad and graduate school, make sure you talk to prospective referees in your fourth year and say, hey, taking some time off, I'll be back in two years looking for references. Would you be willing to write a reference and can you take some notes now? Well, teaching me is still fresh in your mind. Um, the other thing I say to students who are asking, um, everyone's marks are looked at at least twice, uh, once to make sure you make the mathematical cutoff and wants to compare you holistically to other applicants. So yeah, failed courses do play a role in determining how well-suited a program I think you are to their program. Uh, but I'll leave that for more definite answers from the program specialists. There's a lot of questions happening in the chat. Um... I, I can answer for uh, laboratory medicine. We accept five embryology uh, students and five uh, uh, pathologist assistants. We have a question from somebody asking what the difference between the medical genomics program is and the genetic counseling program. Great question. We're in the same department, so we get that question a lot. Uh, the medical genomics program is going to be more of a front-end program. So we're going to be talking a lot about how to deal with uh, genetic test results and how to analyze genomes, um, both sort of looking at sequence alignments, uh, doing a little bit of biostatistics, a little bit of bioinformatics, uh, and then writing genetic test reports. And then so near the end of the program, we'll be talking about how to write up those genetic test reports, which you will then deliver to a genetic counselor. <laughs> Uh, so the genetic counselors are the ones who are then trained to deliver that information to clinicians and to patients and to do all of the sort of clinical work associated with talking to patients. So we're, we're complementary programs with almost no overlapping content. For the Masters of Health Science in Laboratory Medicine, how many applicants are accepted for the role of clinical embryologist? Five. Okay. How many? Okay. I can address the question in regards to failed courses, and at least for our program, we are a physiology program at its core, and so we do require um, certainly high marks and in introductory physiology courses, a minimum of one. We say third year because we have a 300 level course here at UFT. However, we understand that different institutions offer introductory physiology and in different years. So that is a key requirement of our program. So while somebody may fail 
an English class early on, you know, maybe that's not going to impact as much as if they fail physiology the first time, for example, and they have to, to retake it. So just some clarification um, on our program in that regard. Okay. Uh, for genetic counseling program has the application deadline of September 21st, tw September 2021 for uh, international students already been passed or not? So we have completed the application cycle for next for the class of 20 starting in September of 2021. Um, so that maybe that deadline is for the next cycle. Yeah. So okay. um, is there any way we could get connected to students already within the master's programs to talk, ask questions? Absolutely. If you want to talk to anybody from the MedGen program, just feel free to reach out. The same thing with uh, laboratory medicine. If you uh, contact Brandon Wells, he'll be very happy to put you in contact with one of our students. In the unlikely event that staff or faculty from the department can't help you get in touch with students, you can always look into their course unions as well. So any other presenters would allow professional experience be detrimental to my application? I mean, this year in particular, probably not because we understand how difficult it has been for people to get clinical experiences and wet lab research experience. If you have relevant professional experience, I think I can speak for most people that's going to help you. Um, but if you don't this year in particular, it's not going to skewer your application. Uh, for genetic counseling, if we have a CR grade on a, on a required course, would you ask to see that grade or does it depend on the course? I guess it might depend on the course. There are certain courses that are specifically prerequisites for our program. Um, so the, yeah. For OT and genetic counseling, are summer volunteers in terms of valued aspect of application? If so, is that too late for me to apply now for 2021 summer interns and volunteers for 2022 applications? Um, so I guess for our, I can speak for genetic counseling. Um, we, the experience we look at is not just summer, but sort of active experience in on a hotline or, or with some kind of peer support or um, sort of counseling experience. Um, and the longer the experience, the better. Um, and so certainly now for applying next year would be valuable. Okay. Um... For the Masters of Health Science and Lab Medicine, is there a specific email that I can contact to speak with current students in the program? Um, the easiest thing is to contact Brandon Wells and his email was in the presentation and he could put uh, the individual in contact either with a PA or a CE student or both. So in our own uh, information sessions, our students uh, actively participate. Uh, how many students are accepted into medical genomics and what's the competitive average? Sorry if you already mentioned it. Uh, great question. I was just typing an answer, but I'll just oh, say sure. it. Sure. Uh, so Justine, we take uh, for the upcoming cohort for 2021 20, September start date, we're gonna take between 20 and 22 students. Um, and the competitive average uh, is going to be pretty comparable to what other programs have cited. Um, our department requires a B, I think it's a B minus average. Um, but again, you know, sort of echoing what other groups have said, we, we assess programs very holistically. So average is just one part of it. So as long as you meet our minimum GPA, the rest of your application also speaks very loudly. How are grades calculated as the application deadline, usually during the second term of last year? Or how are those credits being considered into the application? I think we probably all do that a little bit differently. Is there a particular program you want to hear from here? <laughs> uh, that was from Joshua. Okay, um, 
if anyone has uh, I think that's okay. Uh, medical genomics, she, she said, Joshua. Yeah, okay. So the way that we do it is that we like approximately because we focus so much on other parts of your application, as long as it looks like you're going to meet our department's minimum GPA, the rest of your application is usually a lot more competitive than just your GPA. So especially for students coming out of undergrad, we'll look at that last set of classes. And if it looks like the spread of your grades has approximately been pretty good, we just sort of assume that the rest of your grades are going to follow suite and that you're going to do fine in your last semester. Um, and so we sort of like have this loose grading criteria for your last term that's just like you're taking the right classes like yes. <laughs> uh, and then you know if you get accepted and you know we have an interview process so that's also a really big part of your application. Um, so because it's such a holistic process we usually say like your last term grades you, you get accepted on things that aren't your last term grades uh, conditionally and then if you fail your last term or you really bomb out in your last term we renegotiate that acceptance. So that's kind of a hazy answer. I'll say that um, okay, go on. most applicants to master's programs are still in undergrad doing their fourth year. So the vast majority of offers that go out are conditional um, on you maintaining your current performance in your program and successfully completing your degree. Um, I guess I'll take one more question. Is the winter 2020 semester being excluded from the GPA count because of COVID? Uh, I have read that many graduate programs are not counting the semester. I guess I can answer for us. We decided to remove the winter 2020 grades from all candidates and, and um, use the rest of the grades to, to evaluate the applications. So, so we didn't want to unfairly bias those that got just a pass as opposed to a, a you know, number or letter grade. I'll just take one more. Would it ne negatively affect my application if I took a year off? No. Okay. So um, I the the session is re being recorded, and I'm going to send it to all the participants. Thank you to all the presenters for presenting for this session, and thank you, and have a great day. I'm going to stop recording. Thanks.